Good afternoon all um, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for this uh, presentation on uh, cable installation risk. Um, I will uh, provide you a little bit of a content of uh, what we are going to discuss during our presentation today. Uh, we'll give a brief introduction to OWC and who we are, <clears throat> uh, spanning to um, what we do and as a, as a consultant. Then we'll run through um, very quickly what submarine cable technology um, is in terms of type of submarine cables. Uh, moving on to principal cabling theory, installation vessels, cable route preparatory works, actual cable installation and burial um, in terms of tools and, uh, and operation. Cable installation analysis, which is one of our core activities, uh, bringing some example of case studies as well, and to, uh, to, to complete the, the overall presentation with a Q&A session. Um, to begin, a uh, few words about uh, who we are as a group. Um, ADL uh, is uh, um, the name of uh, the uh, leading global independent energy and marine consultants, uh, which includes OWC, East Point Geo, Longitude, Indoc, ADL, Watch, Yacht, uh, Yacht, sorry, and uh, John Lebernis and Associates. Um, we are working in the energy and ocean to de risk and drive the energy transition across renewables, maritime, and oil and gas sectors. Um, gas and I uh, are part of the renewable branch of Shore Wind Consultants, uh, who are most, mostly engaged with um, early development um, projects uh, at very, very early stage in terms of uh, owners' engineering and technical due diligence within the um, uh, global offshore renewable industry. Um, uh, more than 60 office uh, and 38 countries around the world, spanning for consultancy, risk management, as well as loss management, with whom I am uh, working very closely. Um, to begin with, uh, the, the core of our presentation tonight, submarine power cable technology. Um, when we're talking about submarine power cable, it's really, really important to make some differences. Now, we have two main uh, block or typology of submarine power cable. We do have submarine cables for offshore wind farm or offshore renewable energy application, uh, which can be uh, divided in array cables, which connect the turbine themselves within the uh, offshore wind um, site, and the export cable connecting the offshore substation uh, to the uh, grid on land. Um, then the second typology of power cable are electricity interconnector, which are classified like um, power infrastructure connecting um, countries, basically sharing electricity between countries. Um, to date, the main difference between these two types of cables is the driven by the um, distance uh, from uh, the wind park and the, uh, the grid connection point on shore, and in the case of the interconnector, the distance offshore between the coast of, of the land, basically of the, com of, the, of the countries they are connecting. Normally, due to their length, um, electricity interconnector are normally uh, using HVDC technology for a number of reasons, driven by the, um, the, the power loss and the, and the distance uh, across, I mean, in terms of the, the, the distance offshore uh, through with where the cable will, will, will run, which are, which are consistent, which are really, really considerable. Um, as opposed to generally as a base case, uh, some marine power cable are, are spanning around in terms of export cable, uh, distance between 40, 30 sometimes, and 70, 80 kilometers uh, from the, the offshore wind park to uh, the grid connection point. The break-even point for the AC technology is usually uh, below 100 kilometers from shore. So normally, uh, less than 100 kilometers from shore, uh, AC is more economically viable compared to DC, while greater than, uh, as, a, as a rule of thumb, than 100 kilometers from shore, usually HVDC technology becomes um, more technically viable from electrical system design and, and uh, uh, electrical power transmission perspective uh, due to the, um, the power loss inherently uh, dictated by the cable length offshore. 
Um, so providing this brief introduction, this is an example of uh, a cross-section of an HVDC cable in a, a single armor configuration. As you can see, um, we have the different layers and usually um, DC cable, especially when it comes to interconnector, um, are laid in uh, bundle. Bundle means that there are two cables basically called uh, positive and negative pole. Um, laid together and wrapped, quotation mark, um, in, in very poor word, uh, bundled together um, in order to, uh, of course, for, for such a long distance, we're talking about 500, 600, 700 kilometers sometimes um, uh, offshore between different countries, um, they are bundled together in order to uh, save time and cost uh, from an installation perspective. This is an example, on the other, on the other hand, is an example of an AC. Cable, uh, as you can see, three core copper uh, is quite quite important cross section, um, and uh, as you can see uh, again, it's a single armor um, similar single armor uh, example of a, of an AC cable. Um, the reason why um, uh, this is this could be potentially a typical export cable cross section uh, for for offshore wind farm. The reason why um, I want to provide this uh, this bit of an introduction is also to provide degree of magnitude of the of the size of this uh, of these flexible structures as they are. And uh, as you we will see later on during this presentation, the inherent risk and and potential damages that can be um, caused by a variety of activities, which include as well burial installation as well as anthropogenic risk on this cable itself. Um, structure of a submarine cable. Again, we have an example of a, a three core in HVAC um, cross section, uh, courtesy of JDR cable system. We have the conductor, the electrical core, one of the most important elements of the, of the cable itself, insulation layer, screening, armoring, and the outer protection. All of these layers have their own function. Uh, they have, have their own young modulus their own mechanical property, their strength, as well as their uh, tensional limitation. As you can see, a cable, especially in a three-core configuration like this, is a very complex structure. Um, cable laying burial uh, and the cable handling itself, even if we're talking about loading, is within the domain of a critical activities to the cable itself, because due to the fact that we do have a complex structure to handle damages can be exerted to the cable itself at various stage of the operation. Mitigation are needed not only in terms of system design, not only in terms of making the structure stronger, but also in terms of installation procedure, metal statement, and common practice in terms of guidances. We'll see this a bit later in the presentation. Um, worth mentioning, um, the uh, emerging technology, uh, which uh, will uh, affect uh, in the years to come uh, the uh, many aspects of the um, offshore renewable energy application, which is the domain of offshore floating wind. Um, for offshore floating wind application, since we do not have anymore a, a bottom fixed structure on the seabed, uh, so therefore there is not going to be any J tube or, or um, tubular structure uh, within which the cable will be pulled in. Um, we see the, the growth of the dynamic power cables or umbilical. These dynamic power cables are laid in um, catenary configuration, which are different and they have between themselves and they have uh, um, uh, drawbacks and, uh, and um, and advantages depending on the catenary itself, depending on the cable itself, depending on the location itself. But also, <clears throat> uh, differently than a regular static cable, they need additional hardware or accessories which are uh, less used uh, or not, not used at all uh, for static application. Some of them are buoyancy models, band stiffener, band restrictor, and uh, cable abrasion protection of touchdown points, for instance. All of these are accessories that are coming into play within the um, dynamic cable uh, domain. Uh, the majority of them are simply the result of a transition from the oil and gas industry, from the flexible risers um, to the um, uh, renewables application within the, the domain of the dynamic power and vehicle. Um, 
going back to static cable, which is the core of this uh, presentation, um, a bit of um, background on cable laying theory. As we all know, any type of offshore operation involves risk. Um, with regards to uh, offshore operation connected to cable installation, we do have um, a number of elements to consider. In general, this is a very complex task due to the fact that um, not only we have the key critical element of the environment playing its part in terms of environmental load, but also we have uh, water depth, the interaction from the cable itself with the seabed and the cable handling uh, during installation stage and burial as well, we'll see later on, on board of the cable lay vessel. So, um, we do have uh, um, available installation equipment uh, uh, and there is a, a very, very long uh, experience from a cable installation EPCI contractor around the world. Um, but unfortunately, there are still elements of consideration within uh, the, cable, the cable installation domain as there is not one size fits all in general. Every site has its own characteristic and every cable has its own uh, mechanical strengths and limitations. Therefore, uh, regardless uh, the, the, the experience of the cable installation contractor, the capability of the vessel itself in terms of station keeping characteristics for a dynamic position type of vessel, elements such as the partner angle, top tension, cable layback, uh, and bending radius uh, are some of the most critical elements that are still uh, playing their, their critical um, part within the whole uh, cable installation risk um, domain uh, during uh, cable installation operation. Um, to date, um, funny enough, um, the, even the modern softwares, even the most advanced uh, uh, cable laying technology and application, they are still using the good old category equation uh, developed by Bernoulli and Euler in 1744. This equation, they, they basically they, they are governing the, the behavior of the, the linear uh, structure, which in this case is a cable, but could be easily a pipeline, a riser, or a bridge. So this hasn't changed. There are still um, the key elements of, um, of, of consideration that drive the, the feasibility of, uh, uh, of the installation of a linear infrastructure, such as a cable. Um, modern uh, softwares have this embedded and included uh, um, uh, within their, their alg algorithm, and they are capable to, to, to give instantly, <clears throat> the, for example, the horizontal distance from touchdown point to the exit chute. Um, they, they, they are able to calculate very quickly uh, what is called um, catenary table, which are the table that drive the uh, feasibility and the, um, the, the boundary condition in terms of uh, tensions and, um, and, um, and cable length and, and, uh, and free span uh, of the cable itself in terms of catenary length, suspended catenary length while uh, installing the cable. And this limits back in the days, uh, 30, 40 years ago, uh, at the, the, the dawn of the software, um, they were basically uh, calculated by hand. Um, but now there are software like this, um, calculating everything and giving you point by point what is the, um, the tension across the cable with a very great accuracy, um, what is the, uh, the layback, uh, uh, the tension at the, at the chute exit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, of course, the critical point um, through the whole system is the vessel. So this is the main means of installation. We do have different type of vessel with different station keeping characteristics um, in terms of uh, capability to um, react to a drive off or a drift off uh, situation and keep the position uh, along the root positioning list uh, with the greater accuracy uh, against the combined environmental loads. Um, Two main uh, typology of vessel in the power cable industry, um, regardless interconnector or export cable or array. Uh, we do have the typical DP2 slash DP3 cable lay vessel for the offshore installation, very highly capable. This is a picture of the Ariadne, a vessel who I've been, had the pleasure to be OAM 
for uh, several campaign, uh, high performance vessel um, with uh, very uh, high um, station keeping capabilities employed to install the cables um, in very harsh condition. As opposite to that, for the shore end, uh, we do have a shallow draft anchor handle cable installation barge with the capability to um, approach uh, areas of the subtidal or intertidal zone very close to the landing point. Uh, flat keels, some of them, um, equipped with uh, spud cans to, um, to ground out and, and uh, constrain themselves at seabed, um, uh, supported by anchor spread or so called spider. These are usually smaller vessels, uh, some of them have also DP capability, and they are used um, where the degree of accessibility at landfall is constrained by a large intertidal zone, mud flat, uh, extended area where it is not possible to achieve a very long pull uh, from a beach perspective. Therefore, you need a vessel capable to approach at some point and sit um, across the intertidal zone, um, being capable to work with tides. This might be the case, for example, of the northeast of England. Um, just to give a glimpse of uh, an operational type of constraint that could be, uh, on the number of constraints that could be involved within the uh, cable pull-in, uh, this is a typical example of a cable pull-in operation through, um, through HDD um, uh, duct. Um, as you can see, uh, vessel being reeled out from the carousel, driven by the tensioner, going through the cable trackway up to the uh, duct entry point. Um, as you can see, this, uh, I want to stop it here for a second. This a complex structure, like a cable, um, is handled within a certain domain control. Uh, by the, um, the vessel uh, cable handling equipment. And this structure has to go through a number of stages from the vessel carousel up to the duct and ultimately at the very bottom end of the constant tension, tension winch located at the transition joint bay. This is an export cable pull-in. Uh, so just to give you an example of how different stages in can 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 um, how, how easy it is to to exceed potentially the tension uh, or one of the tensional characteristics uh, of limitation of the cable itself and actually damage the product so it is really important in this type of operation that not only experienced people is involved but also the, the level of control and mitigation especially in a person like this in the cloud deployment uh, at the end of the pool is, uh, is, is in place. So there is very little room for error at this point. Um, following this stage, the plow deployment is a typical, a typical operation. Um, uh, of course, uh, we start the cable uh, laying uh, process. Um, a little bit, stepping back a little bit, uh, what's happening before that or an export cable route, for example, equally, this can be also transferred, for example, to, to interconnector cable route, it doesn't matter, but for the sake of this, uh, this presentation of within the domain of offshore renewable application, um, within the, the, the export cable um, route domain, let's step back and let, let's look how the route needs to be prepared in order for the burial tool and therefore the cable to be safely installed. Um, I'll be happy to now hand over to my colleague Gus, who will take over from now and will provide you um, all the context uh, required from now on. Thank you, Daniel. Um, well, I'll apologize if I'm not as good as Daniel, but um, yeah, here goes. So I think the first part that we need to look at when, um, when considering the cable installation is obviously what risks that we, we have to consider for the site. Um, highlighted here are a couple of them, and I mean, they become obvious once you start looking at them. So for instance, uh, the first one, rock outcrops and hard substrate. Obviously, at one stage, we'll need to stabilize the cable and bury it just to protect it from external activities. Therefore, rock out, outcrops and hard substrates are obviously an element that we just can't be working with. Looking at uh, high density of shipping traffic, for instance, we don't want to be blocking out a port. So 
the whole concept is that we need to be looking at preparing everything before we come to installation. Now, some of these things can be avoided quite a far back. So we're looking sort of at a stage of sort of root optimization. So we want to make sure that the root, for instance, wouldn't be approaching the rock outputs. I mean, obviously the, the, the easiest way to um, mitigate against the issue is actually just avoiding it completely. So in, in, in as such, some of these elements we, we, we won't be able to, to avoid. So shallow areas, sometimes as you're approaching port, you, you, you're just gonna have to come to it. Um, actually, yeah, you, you could go to the next slide, Emily. Um, but yeah, in, in essence, a good start would be sort of avoidance of issues. So we, we would yeah, take a step back in and, and um, yeah, optimize our route for it. Then when it comes to the actual installation, so once we've established the route and we've realized, for instance, that we have to cross difficulties that we have to go, we, we obviously look at the mitigations and, and the best options that we have. So looking at, at appropriate vessels, you know, if we've got a uh, long distance, uh, a long length route, we probably need to get a vessel with a big carousel. Um, if we're looking at shallow waters, then we need to consider the, the barge, for instance. And then, um, yeah, we 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 also need to consider sort of the um, sort of taking a step back again at all the geotech data that we've got. If we know that um, at the bottom of this, uh, at the seabed we've we've got um, you know sand, for instance, we're probably looking at ploughing the, the territory. The, this um, sort of burial will come into uh, we'll be looking at it in the next section. But then there's also the term, like, as I was saying, sort of avoiding environmental sensitive areas is also important. And we all do that all through routes uh, optimization at well, probably quite a few years before we actually come to installation. But then there are some things that we do a few days or maybe a month before we actually come to, um, to, to laying the cable. One of the ones is the one highlighted there. So we, we, we need to plan the necessary route, um, Sort of preparatory activities for PL up GR, which basically stands for pre-lay grapnel run. In essence, this is just preparation uh, preparation for the exact position of where the the, um, the route's going to go. So the um, yeah, the the grapnel is essentially just a big. I mean, in essence, it's just a tow line, a big metal cable, uh, sorry, a big metal chain, followed by a series of grapnels depending on what you want to catch. If you want to, you know, uh, destroy some, uh, cut through fishing nets or actually pick them up, you might be cutting a flatfish. If you just want to um, pick up other rubbish that's on the seabed, you would be looking at a spear point. And in essence, it, it's it's an important preparation, uh, preparator, preparation activity that we need to do before we actually come to cable installation. As I say, this usually happens about three days. So moving on to, burial tools this is um yeah quite an important element so in, you know, for those that don't know nowadays in the industry we, we don't really ever leave a cable outside um just uh, above the seabed we we always or almost always if possible will be burying it this helps to protect it from external activities as i mentioned before and also to stabilize it in an area where there's a strong current or or um quite a uh, a strong wave, uh, uh, well, basically strong met ocean data. Um, there's a big chance that the cable would displace. And then the other reason we generally bury cables is to avoid sort of scouring. And um, yeah, uh, when it scours, it gives a chance that the uh, cable may, may um, yeah, just leave on that slide. Uh, there's a chance that the uh, cable might start, you know, Getting some adverse shapes that may actually, you know, break the break the cable, lead to a failure, which is uh, something we we obviously want to be avoiding. Should we get to the next slide? Um, so a typical subsea plow is it's quite a lot larger than a lot of people expect. It's it's about sixty meters long, very heavy. It's basically just a big metal block and with a couple of sort of plow shaped. Um, uh, tools at the front. Um, they're, they're, um, they've got some sort of characteristics that limit them in some aspects that we, we also need to consider sort of a, a sort of pre-work stage. So for instance, the, the, we can't really be 
turning them that abruptly. So whenever we're looking at a cable route, we have a limitation of a 600 meter radius minimum to be able to, to go around, um, you know, uh, potential hazards such as uh, uh, rock outcrops or potentially another wind farm. We need to take that into account. And it's, it's basically all directed by the, the plough itself. Plows are also um, quite interesting in the, in the sense that you can literally bring them on shore and uh, run the cable through it and straight out from the vessel, pulling from maybe 500 metres, maybe even a kilometre away, start pulling from it. So that it starts bearing it from the very start, from beach level. And some very advanced ones that are coming up nowadays even have jetting capabilities, hydro plows. They're essentially... Um, they're, they're similar to the plough itself, but right at the sort of the, the cutting edge of the toolet, they they basically jet in water, which helps to um, to fluidize the, the the sediment in front of it, which just allows for sometimes a deeper gut, or just allows to actually reach the, the burial that's required to 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 maintain or all that's been specified uh, to, to for safety in that yeah that video. So in essence, the video that Danielle showed was, uh, before was showing how the plough was getting um, employed by the vessel, and this is just as it approached as the, the seabed. So as you can see, that the black there, uh, uh, the black cable there, is going in from the front, coming out the back, and then we've got the big uh, the tow line just above. Um, so it will start engaging, and what this operation is technically called is, is a simultaneous lay and burial because we're both laying the cable and burying the cable at the same time. Sometimes we have to do this separately. Sometimes you have a pre-lay plow that makes the trench, puts the cable in and then um, buries it back in. But in essence, what we can see here is, is yeah, how we're doing a simultaneous lay um, and burial. And this is a, yeah, a jet trenching hydroplow. So, I think the procedure that you, you guys all saw there is, is essentially how the um, plow is engaging. And hopefully at one stage we'll, we'll be able to see a, a profile view of, of basically how the cable enters, how the cable leaves, and, um, and yeah, what's going on. So this is the, yeah, but thank you, Danny, for something like that. But yeah, in essence, yeah, the cable's coming in. It's kind of just been laying um, not quite on the seabed, but enters quite um let's say with quite a low tension this is quite important for a number of reasons to, to not damage the cable but it comes in with a relatively low uh, tension and is basically just passed through the plow and as i was saying you've got the cutting tool right at the front uh, which is essentially fluidizing the liquid in front just to make the um, burial a lot easier uh, and or, or actually being able to reach the uh, target depth of burial that we are aiming for yeah, so um, in essence, yeah, the uh, kind of as, as I've been um, uh, coming on to, I think this slide sort of shows some of the um, technical specification that we've got. Uh, for instance, that generally we can, um, cable burial can happen at a sort of a speed of about 500 to 700 meters, uh, meters an hour. Um, I think generally it's achievable to go up to even a kilometer. So. I think in essence, when we're looking at cable lays, I think about one kilometer an hour is a good estimate. But of course, sometimes we, we, we have to look a lot lower if it's a lot difficult to achieve that burial. Sometimes it's a lot, well, actually not a lot faster than a kilometer, but that's about the, the right mark. Um, I think it's quite important to notify that during these installations, there is a lot of equipment that controls and monitors what's going on. So. You've got um, equipment that monitors the cable itself, what sort of tension we're looking at the top, um, sort of the departure angle, and then also sort of the, the layback. We'll, we'll come on to this in a second when I look into installation analysis, but there's a lot of uh, tools and equipment that are monitoring this all throughout. And it's quite impressive, sort of that subsea level that we, we can keep such good control of, of, of plow. Um, we often wouldn't actually deviate from the route that we've been proposed by, you know, five meters is probably even quite a big deviation so it is incredible how well we can control these plows as long as all the preparatory work has, has, has worked pretty well 
Um, so looking at cable installation analysis, I think this is probably currently one of the, the most important mitigations that we have out there. I think we, we obviously try and, and apply quite conservative measures for most of the year or, or try and perform extra work to make sure that, um, that we have everything prepared. But I think this is the one element that nowadays has almost become a must. Um, essentially, a cable installation analysis is modeling in software, including uh, which includes sort of the Catenary equation that uh, Daniele was referring to before, looking at sort of the motion of the vessel, looking at a lot of the uh, elements there, and basically modeling the operation and coming out with results. So nowadays, it's essentially almost a must have for marine warranty surveyors. But for those that don't know, they're basically the um, uh, the most important person in offshore work. They, you basically need their approval for any operation to get going. But um, the primary software that, that we use at OWC, for instance, there are a number of others, but I think most of the offshore industry now use it is OrcaFlex, which is developed by Orkina. We use this for a wide range of sort of cable installation analysis that range from sort of pull-in, a normal free lay, shore pull-in, simultaneous lay and burial, and then we also have a look at cable burial. Um, it happens quite often that we, we lose cables, so <laughs> cable repairs are quite common. Uh, we will come back, you know, have a bit of a talk about that in a moment as well. And then also, as we referred to before, in the current industry, we look at a lot of floating offshore. And with that comes a dynamic cable, which brings a lot of more complex elements. Uh, we've got to bring in all the accessories, such as the, um, the um, uh, what well, basically are the, the floating modules, the, um, the CPS at the bottom or the Euroduct potentially. And yeah, we, we have to look at all these elements when it comes to S-Wave. They're, they're quite a new uh, element nowadays. But yeah, uh, for cable uh, installation analysis, I think we require a few inputs. And I think the most, one, most important ones to look at are the cable itself. So we generally would get this from the uh, supplier of the cable. And I think the most, the most important aspects are the mechanical properties. So the stiffness properties are extremely valuable. You know, if, if we've got high stiffness, low stiffness, that obviously can um, affect the, the tension that we're seeing at the top. If we're looking at bending stiffness, this is really important for the relationship with one of the limits, which is the bending radius. And then diameter and the weight are also important to, to attract either the, the shape of the catenary or the drag that is going to be attracting. The other important aspect when we're looking at cables are the limits themselves. So um, th there's always four limits that are vital when it comes to installation. So bending ranges, minimum bending radius is so important. If we overbend a cable, we are probably going to um, either destroy the arm replating, the uh, uh, stretch out the conductor. Uh, there's so many elements or, or potentially even um, letting water, which are better after a few years will eventually lead to, to cable failure. Um, we're also quite important is the tension limit. There's usually a safe working load on these cables. Too, too, too much tension obviously can lead to breakage in the cable. Compression is also very important. This one's obviously related quite a lot to the shape of the cable. If we're letting it, if we're leaving the uh, cable to, to, to be, or very small catenary, uh, uh, when I say small catenary, a uh, uh, very small uh, layback length, we're essentially looking at a, uh, a very big chance that compression will happen, which will lead to damaging the cable. Now, the last one, sidewall pressure, is a little bit less common nowadays. It, it, I think it's basically a relationship between tension and bending radius, and usually before a sidewall pressure failure happens, we probably already had a failure in tension or bending radius. The other element that's important to bring in is the displacement, uh, sorry, is the vessel itself. So the displacement REOs, the loading conditions, you know, if the vessel is going to be really, uh, it's going to basically have a full carousel of cable, or if it's not, um, this obviously affects the displacement uh, REOs, so how much the vessel is moving. This, um, this matter sorts the, um, sort of the cable lay uh, campaigns, sort of if you're right at the start, right at the end it could definitely affect uh, how your vessel reacts to, to, um, to waves. The other important aspect is the chute configuration of the position, basically the radius of it itself, 
how um, uh, yeah how the cable is go is being overboarded um, from the vessel. And then other important aspects are everything that comes from the environment. So the meta oceans, so the waves, the currents, the, the wind, the directions that are more, most prevalent. Local geography, so um, that can include anything from, you know, generally it's water depth is, is our biggest priority, but sometimes we can look at, um, at uh, sort of the profile of the seabed in case we are looking at steep, um, uh, well, basically a steep seabed. And finally, the last element that's uh, important as an input are the operational story records. And I think that speaks for itself. We just need to know how the operation is going to work and, and what's going to happen. So in essence, the, the catenary for a normal cable lay is, is um, shown in the picture there. So I think the four, the four most important elements that uh, Daniel slightly covered are the departure angle, the top tension, the layback, and the bend radius to, um, at the PVP. So most of these can be monitored by a vessel, and generally when we give them results, we'll probably be giving them, our, or what uh, the contractors generally find the most important is, important is top tension and departure angle. Sometimes they don't have an ROV to monitor layback, so they find it a little bit difficult to, to, um, to be able to assess that. And similar for bend radius, it's actually not really a measurable thing. So basically, by giving them a departure angle and a top tension, they should be able to go through some static layback, uh, sorry, some static uh, tables that will provide them, and be able to more or less distinguish and, and be able to predict the layback that there is and what sort of bend radius they're, they're looking at at the bottom. But yeah, should we go to the next slide, Daniel? So here is, is basically uh, an example. So this is a, a cable free lay. This vessel, some of you may recognize. Um, but we've essentially modeled it, we've given it the, uh, the RAOs, we've applied an environment, and we've got three cables going out there. All uh, the three cables that, you, that are seen there are basically three touchdown tensions, so 5, 10, and 15 kilonewtons. And what happens here is, is basically it's a relationship between tension and radius. So the more taut it is, the cable, basically the more cable there is in the catenary. So you're looking at a higher top, uh, top tension and therefore the limit for that one is more likely than not going to be down to top tension. Then when you look at the reverse of so the one that's basically a five kilonewton touchdown tension, so essentially the, the smallest catenary and, and of course the weight, the bigger issue will be because it's, it, it lacks uh, the tension to counteract the effects of the, of the vessel's motion. So what we're looking at here is probably going to be more of an issue with the minimum bend radius limit and uh, compression. So essentially, we would model this, we'd run a thousand cases with all the environments that we expect it and, and would be able to distinguish or would it be able to establish an operational limit. So we'd be able to say from this wave direction, Based on the displacement areas of this vessel, we can look at a maximum uh, uh, HS, so a significant wave height of two meters, for instance. Uh, from another direction, we may be looking at one and a half. Generally, for instance, we um, we kind of think that uh, bow waves are, are the, often the best, or and then of course beam waves are. Well, I, actually, I, I won't go into that. But essentially, through this analysis, um, we can get yeah the operational limits, which the MWS will, will be using to, to be able to say if this operation will go ahead or not, if he thinks he's happy with it. We can also give for um, uh, the operational and the MWS an idea of what is the best uh, catenary setup. So as I was mentioning before, we, can, we have a static lay table. And we can say that, look, at uh, this one, we, we prefer that you keep the cable quite tall. So go for a 15 kilonewton touchdown tension. So basically expand the layback. Therefore, the, any issue that we were looking at when it comes to MBR will be limited. And then the other thing that we can give out is, is basically a weather window. So we can, if, the, if we're given accurate met ocean uh, statistics, we can probably look at, you know, these are our limits. This is what you can expect or how often you may have to stop operations, which can kind of give a good idea for investors at a future date of, you know, how quickly or how, what is the risk when it comes to installation of the cable. 
Uh, do you want to go to the next slide, Daniele? So that's a relatively simple operation. So now looking at a lot more complex. Now, I, I generally get quite a lot of um, praise for how good it looks, the, um, the video that you're seeing on the side here. This is basically um, uh, S-Wave. It says installation at the top, but technically it's, a, it's basically the removal. We removed uh, 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 one of the dynamic cables out of the, um, out of the uh, floating on, uh, Floating turbine. So, what we would do in a more complex operation is basically run a still water first. So we wouldn't run the environment because it it would be computationally just too big. We 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 just don't have the computer power to do such a thing. Um, so we first run a still water and we identify the the stages at which we'd expect more of the issues. So after the still water, we look at um, at the uh, results of the um, still water and um, we'll be able to distinguish what nodes have a particularly bad um, response to to bend radius some of them will find them have high tension and then we basically get a snapshot a screenshot of that exact moment when it was at its worst and we then run all the environments so all the weather environments uh, that we we feel uh, that we needed just as we did with the uh, cable lay in the uh, previous slide but for instance, we found uh, from this slide, stage one, we, we noticed that, that there was quite a bit of an issue when it came to bend radius at the bottom where it's touching the seabed. Um, we found, yeah, that the bend radius was quite bad. So what we did, we extracted that and then we run the environments to calculate essentially what operational or, or the operational limit. So what HS would we actually breach the minimum bend radius, which is our limit um but yeah basically from a more complex study we we, we can also start uh, as well as sort of the usual um verification that the operation will work that we can extract an hs limit um it also allows us to have a look at sort of the methodology do we approve of what was um what was uh put as, as uh, put forward as their storyboards will it work um in the case that we see here, we found out that we, we just couldn't keep the vessel parallel to, to, to the turbine. So we kind of had to first, yeah, keep the vessel uh, almost perpendicular to it and then finally did that spin that you could see. So these are the little um, items that we can do through Orcaflex. Um, yeah. And finally, just as a sort of a, a last one and sort of improvements that we can uh, have a look at. So. I kind of wanted just to put these questions up so that we had a, maybe a little bit of a debate and give you some food for thought. But um, I think a lot of questions come up to us sort of how many offshore wind farm cables are actually damaged by anchor strikes. And until, I mean, I, I'd even say the last couple of decades, I think we, we thought it was a lot, lot higher than it really was. And we've recently been finding out that many of the issues actually come down to a combination of installation issues and, and cable manufacturing issues. So uh, the combination, of, when I say the combination of the two, it, it means that we probably pushed the boundaries a little bit too much in either installation, we, we, we went uh, too far on the HS, and in manufacturing, maybe they gave us a limit that was just a little bit too, too, um, too low. They were probably trying to um, work with the specs that, that, that um, they were being enforced by the client. So th there's a bit of a balance there between installation and uh, the manufacturing. But it turns out, as I was saying, that in the last 20 years, that, that this misconception that anchor strikes and, and even um, fishing gear were actually one of the biggest issues. It's not quite the case. It's definitely a little, yeah, it is a misconception that's been, uh, that we're slowly having a look at and turning around. And I think the other point to, or the next point is sort of, why do we bury cables in, on, in in shore, uh, sorry, near shore to four and five, uh, four, uh, sorry, four to five meters in depth. I think the the pri I think our, our thoughts were, you know, there's more activity near shore, so we 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 needed to you know, bury them further. We needed to keep them away. You know, there's there's a potential chance that um, you know vessels, um, recreational vessels, are going to start uh, uh, coming up and potentially damaging our cables. But um, yeah, is this actually a risk? This is a sort of a question that we're, that we're coming up to, um, to, 
yeah, we, we need to start thinking again. And and that that's kind of the whole point of the third point there is how does this relate to future maintenance work? Are we going over the top with our um with our our portion? Are we sort of costing a lot of money just because we're being over cautious, over conservative, or should we relax a little bit um, to the sort of the guidance and common practices from the 1980s, which essentially were and I find this particularly funny, and I'm not sure how you guys would relate, but the fact that they were saying that burying a cable was uneconomic and just, you know, not worth it. And that, you know, subject to soil strength, ah, you know, just use a 600 millimeter burial deck, you know, that, that'll do the sort of nonchalant attitude that they had. And, you know, if you fancy, you can sort of cover over the buried cable with some, you know, other aspects. It's just this, nonchalant attitude that maybe they had in the 1980s and maybe are over conservative measures now and I think we need to sort of figure out if if what the balance is should we continue on, on us on our um with our approach and, and just keep getting more conservative or do we need to maybe relax a little bit obviously not as far as the 1980s but something needs to um yeah we need to balance that out and then um yeah I, I think the sort of improving the process it, it comes down to sort of we need to have a clear understanding of the seabed through surveys a good geotech team a uh, sensible and well thought out plan which is what i was saying originally about sort of preparation works preparation works could happen two years before the actual operation you know we're looking at um, avoiding all the major issues that we can identify from what we were uh, from the previous point of the seabed you know through the uh, any survey and geotech that work that we did do we need to have a look at the cable burial solutions. Um, how how much risk is the cable at? Are we looking at uh, an area with a lot of um, um, lots of current that would destabilize the cable? Are we going to be um, are we at risk with anchors and fishing gears um, and, and other matters? And then a good level of cable analysis. I showed a couple of examples just to before. They're currently, as I said, the must go. They're very important to sort of establish that cable operation is possible and what the limits are. And then, um, yeah, and then it comes to sort of what we 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 strive at our OWC. We we do our best, at, and it's just to specify our work well, ensure that our contractors know their obligations and standards. We have a look at sort of what the the, um, the bids are, what the uh, what what all the contractors are offering have a, uh, a good or, or basically we, we qualify them and, and, and make sure that we we've got good a good balance between the sort of an economic price and and actual quality and then uh, sort of an insurance that we have the right team the right equipment and then towards the latter stages make sure that our weather patterns which we can't really do much about but we hope that they um yeah, that they work for us. Hopefully, our Met Ocean will give us a good weather window that makes everything a little bit significantly easy. And then, most importantly, just have contingencies and take a pragmatic um, view of absolutely everything when it comes to uh, offshore cable installation. It's a really complex um, um, field in, in engineering, um, so there's a lot going on. Then here are a few of the codes and standards, mainly it's down to the International Committee of Protection for Cables, a couple of um, sort of national, uh, the United States and the European guidelines and the DNV standards. It's worth noting that quite a lot of this is, it, it's not super, there's not that many codes um, out there for, for cable install or actually for the, let's say the, prepar uh, the preparatory works for, for cable installation. It's quite limited. There's not that much out there, but um, a lot of it comes through experience between the EPCI contractors, um, ourselves as a consultancy, and, um, and and nowadays a lot of software. And then, yeah, we come we come to the end, and we invite uh, any questions. <laughs>